regulatory and tariff considerations that uh, you're probably all hearing about and um, what the priorities are and how you might want to plan your business uh, for the future with respect to these these actions and these, these priorities of the administration with respect to trade. Um, so to start with, I um, want to hit you with an uh, outline of sort of the broad topics I'll be covering and um, touching on. I don't think I need to reread it to you there, but that's the general order of things I'll be covering today. Now, with respect to the uh, trade policies of the administration, um, broadly, one of the common denominators underpinning the trade policy agenda is creating a level playing field. We know that on a level playing field, U.S. building product, products can compete anywhere in the world. Developing markets or advanced economies uh, near or far from our borders. And uh, as I go further through my slide, you'll see why we really believe that U.S. building product producers and hardwood uh, producers such as yourselves can really expect to succeed internationally. And if you have a question, don't feel like you have to wait till the end of the presentation. Just raise your hand and uh, let it be known. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, who sets the details? Who creates the details here for the presidential trade policy? Well, the president does in consultation with. You'll uh, if you'll restate that. I, I'm sorry? The details. Right. I, I know if he did that. Right, well, that's done in kind of, he works with Secretary Ross, uh, the uh, Under Secretary Gil Kaplan with, for the Inter Inter International Trade Administration. He also works with the um, uh, Ambassador, the, the, the Secretary of, not the Secretary, the Ambassador for the U.S. Trade Representative. Basically, his cabinet, in consultation with him, puts together his, his trade agenda. From your office, is that a consensus? Yes. So, <clears throat> with respect to the NAFTA, and uh, while the activities around NAFTA renegotiations have uh, diminished a bit over the recent history, um, we do expect to re engage with uh, our North American trading partners in trying to get to uh, the finish line on a renegotiation of NAFTA. But um, this gives you an idea of the, the focus of the negotiations, that uh, NAFTA has generated significant gains for forest products trade, and that um, we're maintaining, we're working to maintain existing benefits and expand trade opportunities via free trade. And there are the four areas that we're focusing on with respect to our renegotiation in the U.S. Trade Representative. And to give you a little idea of some of the numbers, in 1993, U.S. exports of pulp and paper and wood products to Canada and Mexico were just over $5 billion. In 2017, these exports have grown to over $13 billion. U.S. imports of forest products from Canada and Mexico also grew under NAFTA, but not as much. Imports grew from 1993 level of 14.5 billion to 19.5 billion in 2017. This gives you a chart to give you an idea of the impact that uh, trade, free trade within the North American region has meant. Again. Some growth of U.S. forest products exports to Canada and Mexico had started before NAFTA went into effect, but once NAFTA was put into place in '93, as you can see here, the growth exploded. Wood products exports to both Canada and Mexico grew from 1.6 billion in 1993 to 2.9 billion in 2017, and you can see the chart also gives you an idea of what happened with wood pulp and paper. 
big, big growth in, in those products. So I know this is a hardwood conference, but the softwood lumber uh, trade dispute, I guess we'll refer to it as probably at least some interest to the folks in the room. Um, it, this is a Trump administration priority. Uh, right now, the AD and CDD margins and orders are published, duties are being collected, and uh, the proceeding is moving along as determined by law and regulation. Um, right now, uh, there are expedited reviews being conducted, and expedited reviews are when companies that believe they have no subsidies uh, that they receive from Canada try to apply and get their own uh, rate with respect to the CED rate. And countervailing duty, and just I don't want to get into too much detail, but that's when a company is receiving some sort of government aid to provide lower prices on what they sell into the United States. We have laws against that. And this expedited review process is an opportunity for companies that believe they can show they've gotten no subsidies uh, to try to get their own rate calculated. So that's proceeding. And then in January 2019, uh, all the rest of the companies in Canada can start applying for what we call administrative reviews. And the first administrative review will kick off in January of 2019. Real briefly, I want to touch on the uh, Section 232 um, national security um, trade actions that are moving underway. Um, just to give you a quick understanding of, of the process, once an investigation is initiated, the Secretary of Commerce has 270 days to present the department's findings and recommendations to the President. Those reports have been completed, and they concluded that the quantities and circumstances of steel and aluminum imports threaten to impair the national security as defined by Section 232. The reports found that United States steel imports were nearly four times our exports, and that aluminum imports had risen to 90% of total demand for primary aluminum. The Commerce Department recommended that the President Trump take action to protect the long-term viability of our nation's steel and aluminum industries. Tariffs are now in effect at the levels determined by the President. Individual companies can request product-specific exclusions from the tariffs through an application process run by the Bureau of Industry and Security. And I know that a number of these exclusion requests has, have been completed. Um, I was having a little difficulty finding examples of these, but I have heard in popular media that a number of companies are getting rulings on their exclusion requests. And um, so, you know, the, the, the process is moving along. Companies are finding out what they can expect to be able to bring in tariff-free and what uh, other steel products will be coming in with a tariff. Um, just to give you an idea, to date, well over 900,000 comments on the steel exclusion docu docket have been submitted, and again, considerably more than 1,500 comments on the aluminum comment. So as those trade actions affect the mills and other parts of your business, um, it's a good idea to understand what, what is progressing with respect to the steel and aluminum tariff actions and then as I'm sure a lot of you know in May in May we uh, started an investigation as to whether or not uh, auto the auto industry is a national security concern and has it uh, does it require some sort of protection here in the United States. Section 301 now these are the more broad uh, product covers, they cover a num in just about anything that is traded, but it focuses on a, um, a region or a country. And in this case, the 301 trade actions are focusing on the trading actions of our trading partner, China. <coughs> um, you see here a rundown of the highlights of what's been going on with respect to the Section 301 
uh, trade actions. Um, the one of the highlights, uh, the correction I want to make sure you're aware of, is the July 2017, the July 17, 2018 um, trade action. There is a list associated with that. Um, so uh, there is a what we'll call a list three, and that list is where a number of the forest products, a lot of the Chapter 44 products are unfortunately included. So the U.S. is proposing that um, tariffs begin to get collected on a number of forest products, including wood coming from China, have a tariff levy against them. And uh, uh, with respect to uh, preparing for that, I think I'll defer to Dana to help you get prepared for that, but um, I'll try to give you an idea of how these tariffs are being considered, the process that's going, that the administration is going through, so you can understand when things will start happening and when they'll start impacting your business. So, as directed by President Trump, the U.S. Trade Representative has conducted a thorough investigation of China's practices and policies that harm or threaten U.S. innovation and investment. USTR's investigation in the Section 301 case, conducted in close cooperation with my Department of Commerce, spanned months, taking into account many dozens of written submissions and hours of oral testimony, and resulted in a 215-page report detailing Chinese policies and practices that are estimated to cause at least $50 billion in harm annually to the U.S. economy. And that report that I referenced, that's available to the public. You can download that report from the USTR website and read it if that's uh, of interest to you. You can go through the substantial detail that the administration um, went through to provide itself with the determination and the action to go forward with these 301 tariffs. These practices that, Chinese, uh, had, that the Chinese government engaged in um, to give the administration the ammunition it needed to move forward with them are as follows. China uses foreign ownership restrictions to pressure technology transfers from U.S. companies to Chinese entities. Chinese technology regulations forcing U.S. companies to license technologies to Chinese entities on non-market-based terms that favor Chinese recipients. China's direction and unfair facilitation of the acquisition of U.S. companies and assets by Chinese companies to generate large-scale technology transfer in industries deemed important by state industrial plans, and China conducting and supporting cyber-enabled theft and, and intrusions into U U.S. companies to access their sensitive commercial information and trade secrets. As a result, the President has directed his administration to take a range of actions to counter these threats, including WTO lit litigation, retaliatory tariffs, and investment restrictions. And here, mainly, these dates and these bullets are focusing on the tariff component of the actions that the President is, is moving forward with. And most notably, you see there the uh, June 20th Notice of Action. That's the first tranche of tariffs that we're actually beginning to start collecting with respect to this tariff action. And the docket is now open. It opened on July 11th. Uh, the docket is open for exclusion requests, and that, that docket will close on October 9th. So if there is some sort of input that you happen to get from China that might be on list one, um, I encourage you to consider requesting exclusion uh, if you're unable to get that input from a, a U.S. producer. Uh, real quickly, some other, I'll call them trade priority communicating actions that the administration has taken with respect to executive orders impacting trade. Uh, you see here a list of executive orders. In summary, each of these executive orders asks, how do we get freer and fairer trade? 
uh, the Trump administration is looking at trade from a variety of angles with the goal of using different mechanisms to help level the playing field for U.S. companies. These executive orders show determination to tackle unfairness and expand U.S. opportunities by investigating the causes of trade deficits, U.S. regulations that impede trade, violations of existing trade agreements showing where trading partners are not playing by the rules, and trade promotion opportunities involved in buying American goods and services and hiring American workers. Uh, each of these orders is on the internet, the White House site. A number of them are also on the Commerce or USTR site. So if you are interested in learning the details of these executive orders, I encourage you to either call myself, I'm happy to help direct you to them, um, or do a little bit of Google searching on your own and uh, you can find out the details on them. And then, uh, earlier this year in May, um, I, 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 an issue that's been impacting this industry is uh, the increase in quarantine and phytosanitary inspections on log exports. And uh, I think this is probably in response to what I've been hearing about anecdotally in the industry that uh, for a while, for at least a few months, some exports of logs to China that hadn't been fumigated had been getting into China either through Hong Kong or going directly to China. And my suspicion is that uh, the Chinese government is trying to address this work around this uh, understandably concerning practice and starting to really ramp up their inspections. Um, however, we're making sure that this is being done in the most fair and impartial way and objective way possible. And so if, uh, if this is a practice that is impacting your business and you want to make sure that uh, your interests are being addressed, uh, I encourage you to reach out to the two USTR representatives I've indicated here on the bottom of the slide, outline your concerns and see how they might be able to make sure that your concerns are being addressed and considered as we work with China to make sure that this particular inspection policy is done in accordance with their trade agreements, WTO rules, etc. All right, so now we're moving on to how the Department of Commerce and the International Trade Administration can work with you to help you expand your export markets. Things that we can do and working with you hand in hand to help you export and give you an idea of what's going on with respect to markets and give you an idea of the growth that's out there. Excuse me. So, for purposes of this discussion, um, I know everybody here is working in the hardwoods industry, but my office, the Office of Materials Industries, we track 15 different subsectors that we consider our building products portfolio. And within that building products portfolio, wood is one of the, the markets. So I wanted to make you aware of some of the work that we're doing with respect to trying to identify markets for building products producers throughout the United States and uh, help you understand some of the context and flavor of some of the slides coming up. There are some hardwood specific slides that I'm going to also be presenting. But as you consider where you might want to find opportunities export-wise, uh, think about the other ways that your products might be integrated into some of these other systems or, or uh, other products that we export and how you might be able to find opportunities by being an add-on or value-added part of some of these other systems, for, for example, windows and doors. Um, so the extensive trade policy agenda under the administration is all about leveling the playing field. We know that on a level playing field, U.S. building products compete extremely well. And one of the bullets I really want to pull out of this slide, uh, the vast majority of building products exports over the last, uh, over the, in 2017, went to 10 countries. And we're going to 
get into more detail about that, but that's, that's important to know. We export over 200 markets, and I'll give you an idea of uh, you know, some of those markets, but 75% um, of our exports are going to 10 countries. So I told you about those 15 subsectors of the track. Um, this is a bit of a dense slide, hard to read, small print, uh, so I encourage you to review it in more detail when you uh, get the PDF from Tom. But um, you get an idea of where we see growth. The green highlighted sections of this show where we show where we expect to see growth in these uh, export sectors. And um, it just gives you an idea of broken down by sector, subsector of building products, the movement in trade internationally. So again, we're going to narrow down to six of those 15 subsectors. And in 2017, we exported $84.5 billion worth of U.S. goods. And the six sectors we're going to focus on totaled $32.7 billion in 2017, about 30, almost 39% of total U.S. building products these six sectors make up. You see down there, um, I'm mean, sorry, up in the upper left-hand corner, right-hand corner for you folks. Um, in 2017, 8.1 billion in wood products. So this sec this slide, I think, is is uh, really important to help you understand that U.S. building products exporters find success in any market that is, has a level playing field. You see there, we export to 214 different markets around the world. And they're developing economies, they're developed and advanced economies. And, you know, when performance and quality and consistency is important to a customer, they come to the U.S. for building products. And this really helps you understand that you can find success anywhere in the world, and we can help you find those markets. And I'm not sure I said it directly, but you see there that, you know, in 2017, basically, we split our exports evenly between advanced and developing economies on a value basis. This gives you another look at uh, those six key subsectors and the level of exports we've had since 2009. But what I'm, what I'm trying to set up for you through here is that while this gives you an idea of where we're exporting and how much we're exporting in various different products. Um, I want to give you an idea of how our office and the International Trade Administration and industry analysis can help you really get a handle on where to expect opportunity in the future. Here's another look. You look at the different subsectors. With a, within the, each sector, you see the, the movement in trade. You see there wood. Basically, our second largest subsector within this six. Wood is a very, wood and wood products are a very important part of the U.S. export profile. So I think I talked to you a little bit about how the top ten markets are, are sticky. They're important to U.S. building products exporters. Uh, so you see here the top ten markets that we exported to in 2007, and the top ten markets that we exported to in 2017. And basically, they're unchanged. Um, the, the only difference is that Australia and France uh, switched positions in 2017. But uh, for the uh, developing markets, developing markets have been growing more important. China has grown from 5.8% of exports to 13.5, and Mexico's share is increasing. 
Uh, these are dense export markets, uh, but they grew slightly from to with 75 percent of exports. Uh, they were 71 in 2007, so they've grown. These 10 export markets have grown by 4 percent over the last 10 years, uh, and these markets continue to pro provide opportunity for U.S. building products exporters. Um, we want to acknowledge this, but we also want to look beyond these markets to new demand centers, especially for the wood markets. So that brings you to this slide. This is our top market reports. And this is a series of reports that are a real deep dive into the export markets that we at the Department of Commerce want to encourage U.S. companies to really consider and give you reasons why to consider them. Um, this current, I mean, the, this particular um, top market report on sustainable construction and building products uh, is the one most directly related to the products that you all work in. But there are other top market reports in aerospace, automotive parts, uh, construction machinery. Um, there's a total of, I think, approximately 28 different top market reports. So I encourage you to go to the uh, website there at the bottom, uh, top market reports, and see what, uh, what report might help you grow your business. So, I want to give you an idea of the methodology that we use to sort of help you understand how we determine the markets you can expect growth in. Um, we're interested, interested in looking at new demand pockets and markets outside the top 10. So we've highlighted markets where we see positive compound annual growth rates over the past five years, and also a jump in year-on-year -year demand in 2017. This helps us identify markets worth a closer look to determine future demand growth potential. So this is how we did it. And for these six markets, we've identified these number of markets. You know, and focusing on wood, we have 12 different markets that we really think are going to be good opportunities for growth and exports. So here's a summary of those markets. And then the next slide is going to focus on the numbers. So you see here the the, the outcome of the uh, of the analysis here and why these 12 markets are where we think you might want to find growth in exporting. China, Vietnam, Jamaica. And then you may know that a lot of trading partners internationally are responding with retaliatory tariffs against U.S. exporters. Uh, right now, the only country I've seen that has any sort of retaliatory tariff on wood products, and when I say wood products, I'm saying chapter 44 wood products is Turkey. Um, now, as we've been talking about this list three that has um, tariffs on Chinese imports into the U.S. that also includes wood products, um, that could change, but we haven't seen any sort of retaliatory list from China in response to the, the, the new $200 billion in trip tariffs that we're expecting to uh, move, be moving forward with. But for the time being, Turkey is the only one that has any sort of retaliatory tariff on wood products. So the rest of these are still pretty strong markets. I'm not sure where China's going to go given all the trade actions and the 301 trade actions, but time will tell and we'll work together. And please stay in communication with myself, with Dana, with Tom, and we'll help you be prepared for those changes as they come. All right, hardwoods. Brian, if I could ask you a question there, sure. real quick, because I think this is something to be important to the group. Many of them are getting some pushback now from their Chinese customers. There are orders that are that are being canceled or trying attempting to be renegotiated um, as the Chinese businesses are using 
the threat of tariffs or the tariffs as an excuse to try to cancel orders and cancel orders for lower prices. Are you hearing any of that? Is that getting reported to you at your level? Well, I have to confess they weren't until you told me last night at the reception. I hadn't heard that. But as I thought about it later on, um, you know, we do have an advocacy office of the Department of Commerce and the International Trade Administration. Uh, if they actually carry through with that, uh, we might be able to help. I, I do have to warn you, those processes move kind of slow, and you may not find a resolution quickly, and you could probably lose your whole profit margin or the whole accounts receivable as that container languishes in the Chinese court trying to wait for our resolution, but we'll work as quickly as we can with you to try to get to the bottom of it. Um, but I do want to encourage you, as these types of things happen, please let us know, because when we reach a certain critical mass of this kind of stuff, if it's if it's one-offs, it is concerning, and we want to try to help. Uh, but the, the, the cogs of government move, unfortunately, a little slow in these agreements, and we may not be able to help you right away. But when we reach a certain critical mass, we can start addressing the problem on a, on a bigger scale. Yes, ma'am. Um, can, can I just mention as well, Tom? Um, just from the Hardwood perspective, or the Hardwood Federation perspective, we are reaching out to Congress to share these stories as we hear them. Um, uh, as you all know, we go to a lot of meetings, we go to a lot of fundraising events, and over the last few months, Trade has probably been the first five topics of discussion at any meeting that we've been at. Um, we're just starting to hear the hardwood side of stories. Uh, agriculture's been huge. Um, the aluminum and steel has obviously been big, and a lot of the manufacturing sector or businesses have, have had a lot of discussion here. We're starting to hear stories. Anything that you have that you can share with us that you're willing for us to share, we don't necessarily need to use company names. But if you have these stories, it's really helpful for us when we go into congressional offices to give some uh, concrete examples of how the current disputes and the current negotiations are impacting your companies. Um, our line has been, you know, we understand where the administration goes and what their goals are, however, they need to understand that there are impacts being felt by businesses in all sectors, and we want to give them some stories so that they can have the power and the authority to get back to the negotiating table and try to make some resolutions, try to move forward in these discussions. Um, we've got a couple of different ways to do that. On Thursday, some of you may have seen that we sent out links so you can go directly to your members of Congress if that's what you're most comfortable doing. Um, I know Tom, we talked about this last night, he'll be sending it out as part of his newsletter later this week as well. I know um, Mike Snow has been reaching out to his membership to gather uh, information and stories, and Mike and I obviously talk a lot these days, and we'll be sharing information. And later this week, I think tomorrow, we'll be going out with a request for you to share stories with us that, uh, again, we can use with members of Congress. I think NHLA will also be going out with a survey uh, gathering data and information. So there's lots of ways that you can communicate with, with kind of our community, the association community. Um, if you'd like to call me directly and chat about it, that is fine as well. But we are trying to get a good handle on this and the more information that we have, the better. So, you know, Brian's, Brian's staff does a great job and, and will work and we, you know, Brian and I are in communication. But, um, you know, we can get to members of Congress, but that's really not something that Brian and his team are, are able to do on a regular basis. And just to, yeah, just to put a little final point on that, uh, Dana sits on my Industry Trade Advisory Committee. Um, I'm the Secretary DFO, the Secretary Designated Federal Officer for the Industry Trade Advisory Committee on forest products, building products, construction, and non ferrous metals. Just rolls right off the tongue. But anyway, that collection of uh, industry leaders and technology, I'm uh, sorry, uh, industry and trade association uh, representatives help advise the administration on its trade policy, and they get to see a lot of what the administration is considering with respect to trade prior to it actually becoming an actual policy. And they help advise the administration on its considered policies, and Dane's part of that. So we actually have a very formal connection that we can work with. Um, so I encourage you to, to um, work with Dana, and I'm trying to get Tom on the committee too, so hopefully we'll have one more contact as well. 
And if any of you are interested in advising the, uh, the, the administration on this trade policy and think you might want to be a part of the uh, Industry Trade Advisory Committee, please uh, see me or reach out to me. My contact information is at the end of this uh, presentation. And I'd, I'd like to get you started on the process. So getting back to uh, the export picture for hardwoods in the U.S. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Uh, this chart here gives you an idea of where the United States uh, has been exporting hardwoods uh, since 2010. And um, you see the uh, top, I think I've got the top eight markets here, top nine markets, starting with uh, China being our largest export market, and uh, Canada, Vietnam, the United Kingdom, Mexico. You can see the levels there over the over the years. In 2018, that is a projected and annualized, that's based on the first five months of the year, uh, annualized out over a year, so that, that's a projection. That's not an actual number. But, um, you know, it's not surprising that Canada is one of our biggest export markets. China is a huge export market. And uh, I think the slide pretty much speaks for itself. And um, if you have any questions, let me know. The next mark, the next slide is where are we importing hardwoods from? And um, you see there the impact of the anti-dumping and countervailing duty order on imports of hardwoods into the US from uh, our trading partners. Again, we have the top six there, six markets we import from, but the ABCD order in 2017, which is, uh, you see our world imports just plummet because we're not bringing in hardwood, plywood from China anymore. Uh, I think the rates are around 200%, and that's pretty dramatic. Uh, I think there might be something else going on in those numbers. I, I wasn't able to get to the bottom of it, but clearly a big part of that drop has to be that ABCD proceeding that's moving along. So finally, um, just to touch on how we can sort of work with you, our boots on the ground, how we can work directly with you um, and help you export and be a part of your export business plan. Uh, we have, throughout the United States, um, 106 U.S. export assistance centers, mainly in our larger cities. There's probably one near you. Um, and I can help put you in touch with your U.S. Export Assistance Center. And at these centers, we have specialists that know about the various ways to get you into export markets. If you're already exporting, how to get you into new markets. If, you're, if you've never exported, how to get you started. Uh, and we can start from the most hand-holding to just a few little nudges here and there to get you exporting more and more. Um, and then once the people here on the ground in the U.S. get you ready to go, we have a global network. And our global network, this is through our consulates and embassies abroad. We have um, U.S. commercial service people who are working in our consulates and embassies. They also work with people from those countries, uh, people working in the embassy, all these people have security clearances, but they know the economic and business environment of the countries that you're trying to export to. They can really help you find really solid, vetted customers and get you into these markets in ways that um, are difficult to do on your own, particularly when you're a small company. We can be your export office and help you get into these markets and through this network we can help support you and get you exporting and provide you with really solid customers. Thank you. Yep, that's it. So there's my contact information. Um, I know 
uh, we wanted to talk about tariffs and the 301 tariffs, especially that uh, that last. I'm going to go back to that slide. I know it's a ways back. So this is probably the trickiest tariff minefield we'll be encountering, particularly the the new trade action on two hundred billion dollars, the two hundred billion dollar trade action that the uh, hearings just uh, just happened last week. Uh, that's where. Chapter 44 products finally showed up. But again, that's on imports, so I don't know how much that's going to impact what you are doing. But um, please let us help. We really are here to help, in spite of uh, former President Reagan's comment I'm from the government, I'm here to help. But please let us know how we can grow your businesses and get your export, get you that you're exporting. With that, I think I'll take any questions that anyone might have. What's the time schedule to implement the $200 million tariff? Well, they've had the hearings. So if you look at, um, for example, the June 20th action, we're starting to collect tariffs on that. Um, that started in March of 2018. So what is that, three, four months? It could happen as quickly as October, November. Um, this, these types of trade actions are at the discretion of the administration. So, you know, just to give you an idea, the March 22 actions, the administration could have waited until, I think it was October, to actually take any sort of action uh, according to the, the regulations that sort of outline how these processes move forward. He chose to move, I mean, the administration chose to start earlier, but he would have been well within the regulatory confines of, of the of the law, waiting until October. So maybe October, maybe next year in February, March. It just sort of depends on how things move. You know, if something happens like with the European Union, you know, we've agreed that as long as we're talking, we're not going to impose any tariffs right now. So something like that could happen here. Yes? If I understand it correctly, the $200 billion is 10% duty? Correct. I just wanted to know how you get to 10. Oh. I'm sorry. Uh, if I understand it correctly, the, the $200 billion is a 10% duty. And I just wanted to know if that's correct, how, how the administration got to 10% as opposed to 25% on the uh, so, it's based on the advice that it collects from the Department of Commerce and the U.S. Trade Representative and the other trade agencies that are involved with the interagency review of the whole body of, of analysis that, that the administration considers when it, it moves forward. Um, that's how the administration considers all of these factors. We give them an idea of U.S. capacity, U.S. businesses, U.S. impact on the economy. Uh, it's a fairly extensive body of information they consider. It's all on now, Brian. I know there's a number of folks that have watched that closely over the last week or so. Dana sent out that information and, and, and capsulized that a little bit to focus on more on the hardwood sector. but. We have members on both sides of that. We have members that are secondary manufacturers that are competing against some of this product that's coming in from China that are in favor of additional tariffs. But then we have primary manufacturers that are sending wood to China and that product coming back here with a tariff, they're concerned that their market's going to close in China or the Chinese customer will be um, looking for product from somewhere else or the Chinese government will put a tariff on our product going into that. So how does commerce balance? all of those factors when the primary manufacturer wants to export but a domestic manufacturer that doesn't want to compete with that product coming back well i mean we 
basically we just provide the administration with as much information as we can about the companies that are going to be impacted on either side of the issue. We try to give them an idea of the level of that impact. And at the end of the day, the, the, the president and his advisors take all that and they decide on the rates they're going to move forward with. Um, so we basically inform them as best and as completely as we can. And you saw what we did with a 215 page report. Um, and that's, at the end of the day, the buck stops with the president and he makes a decision and he moves forward with, with the rates that you've seen. Any other questions? One, to, one more follow up on that, Tom, is that, you know, a lot of this anecdotal information that, that Dane and I had mentioned, in so much as we're able to provide the administration with direct feedback from the trading public, that also is part of our analysis and we provide them with sort of hands on anecdotal evidence of harm or assistance that a particular action might have. So please stay in touch with us. Um, the exemptions from the tariffs, yes. does there have to be no U.S. supplier or? Well, so when you require, when you request an extension, you'll put together your request and you'll explain the product that you import and the physical and chemical description that helps us understand what the product is and where you get it from. And then we take that information and we'll try to find if there's any U.S. production. Uh, if there is U.S. production, if a U.S. producer out there makes the product that you're trying to bring in and they have an objection to you getting an exclusion, generally we won't let the exclusion go forward. Um, but if there's no U.S. production, if there doesn't seem to be any mothballed capacity out there uh, for a particular product, um, we will give the exclusion request very serious consideration. We're, uh, we're in the chemical business, as you may know, over 90% of our active ingredients of all pesticides, whether they're for wood or ag or anything made in China. Um, numerous actors already in worldwide shortage due to their pollution, you know, shutting, rolling shutdowns and plants for pollution. So, you know, there is one of our main actors, there is one U.S. manufacturer running half speed right now, but they're in the ag market and they will not supply. So, I mean, it's there. I can't get it. Can I get the exemption? Maybe. <laughs> I, wish, I wish I could be more specific, but, I, you know, I, it all depends on many involved thinking heads on the, on the topic. Um, but, you, as I like to say, you don't get it if you don't ask, so make sure you at least put it in the request. That's the first step. To Lance's point that, that we're the metal side of it, so aluminum and steel hit us. And uh, along those lines, it's not that there's not manufacturers in the U.S. obviously that can provide, but they're basically sold out. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of availability. Mm -hmm. And so to that end, we, could, we wouldn't be able to get an exclusion, possibly, under what you're saying, because of the fact that there are manufacturers here. It's just that they're sold out. They can't provide the materials that are required, so we have to go outside. Yeah, uh, and, and again, in those situations, you know, um, I have to give you the proverbial maybe, but you've got to try, you've got to ask, and you might get the extension, especially if you provide a lot of evidence and documentation showing that the U.S. suppliers are running full tilt and they still can't meet demand, and so you have to go outside the U.S. to get it. Um, but, uh, you know, we won't take your word for it. You're going to have to show us some evidence that that is the case. And we'll probably reach out to those potential U.S. suppliers and ask them what sort of capacity they're running at and things like that. So. Won't take his word for it. Did you know Dan prior to today? <laughs> that, but well, I'm not picking on him. We won't take anybody's word for it. <laughs> All right, but, any other questions? All right, thank you, Brian. Thank you.
And again, Brian's remarks will have available for you. Um, his slides, rather, will have available for you by PDF. So please let me know or let Wendy know um, before you leave the meeting. Or if you get back, if you want to review some of those things, let us know in the, the 